Okay. Okay. I think we're live. Yes, we are. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, yes, it is afternoon. It's 1 p.m. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila OJ, um, Communications Manager for Jobberman Nigeria. And today we're going to be having conversations on corporate loyalty. It's a very interesting conversation, really. Is corporate loyalty dead? Um, and in this era of the Grace Resignation, which we'll talk about um, shortly with our wonderful guests, um, there's a whole conversation around resignation, there's a conversation around talent retention, and coincidentally, Jobberman Nigeria just released an employee satisfaction report, which talks about the external traits and the intrinsic traits that employees are looking out for in companies that they are working for, right? And it, it works as an, it works as a, a, like a, an insight and call to action for employers on how to retain talent, keep your employees satisfied. But I don't want to talk too much and then, you know, give out all the secrets before we even start the event. It's just like one minute in. So <laughs> I will, I would like us to start with in with our wonderful guests most of them we've already seen here before i mean trb has been with us a few times <laughs> idris is here <laughs> idris is here with us so i would just like them to reintroduce themselves to us and then we'll take it from there Okay, I guess I'll go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to be here again. Um, always exciting, you know, to share knowledge. And uh, I think this is one of the most exciting platforms, you know, for our young people out there, you know, educating us on what's changing, what's trending in the employability space. So I would say kudos to Jobberman for this initiative. Um, Tim Tokwe, Richard Banji, um, lead talent development at the Mastercard Foundation. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm here. I'm here to always support, always share knowledge and, you know, share insights. And uh, I enjoy the comments section as well. So please drop comments as we're going along. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions. I mean, this is an opportunity for you to learn, um, unlearn and relearn. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Idris. Thanks, um, TRV. Uh, my name is Idris Abdgafar. I'm the head of human resources at Jobama Nigeria. Um, you know, as TRV had mentioned, the focus for us is always to push conversations as regards employability, the world of work, recruitment, and everything within the HR space um, as it applies to employers as well as job seekers, um, constantly just sharing information, sharing knowledge on how you can stay um, optimizing this world of work to get better. Oh, Aramide has just joined. Yes, and Aramide just joined right on time. So Aramide, please introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if everyone can hear me. Uh, um, yes, we can. Initially, yes, oh, we fantastic. Can. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sheila. Hi, JB. It's so great to connect. Uh, Idris, I'm not going to say that to you with like a while back. <laughs> I've met you before. <laughs> Anyways, I was just a fantastic connection with you again. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, my name is Aramide, and I'm a recruitment specialist at Florida Wave. I support more engineering and USRS. Uh, so, uh, so far, so good uh, in terms of anything, uh, talent management, with Florida Wave, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and for, what's it called? Uh, retention as well. Yeah, you can count me in. And um, the talent community is a very uh, big community, a limited, big, small community, and we love to share information. So, it's actually an absolute pleasure being here. Fantastic initiative by Florida Wave or by <laughs> Job Amount Anytime. Yeah. Yes, and we're glad to have <laughs> you here as well, Aramide. Right. So before yeah, we go right. into like, you know, the deep questions, um, I would say my first question is what does corporate, like the theme, like I remember when I got the brief, like corporate loyalty, is corporate loyalty dead? I was like, oh my God, like <laughs> really. Um, but interestingly, it's a conversation that has been, has been brewing over time, really about this whole thing about, especially when you go on like platforms like LinkedIn, and people are talking about corporate loyalty 
um, talking about the great resignation, you realize that, okay, this is actually something that's very important. Um, so my first question is, what does corporate loyalty mean to you? Um, you can start with you, TRB. Yeah, I mean, a very interesting topic. I actually struggle to, to define it, right? Um, but I mean, let's, let's just bring it down to the level of all of us, you know. Corporate loyalty is just saying, asking those questions of, you know, why would I stay with an organization? I think that's just the simple terms. Why would I be with an organization? Why would I want to spend 10 years of my career, you know, with a particular organization? You know, so those are the questions. And, you know, what, what led to this question is because of the trend and the changes we are seeing, you know, in the space today. You know, while we have our parents, some who did 30 years in one organization and they felt fulfilled, right? So the question now is what has changed? Why do we have people, um, you know, moving six months, one year, two years, just moving around? So I think that that's the question we are trying to answer. Um, corporate loyalty, is it really dead? Or are there things that, you know, are affecting it and all that? And uh, yeah, looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks. Aramide? Uh, for me, uh, personally, I think uh, corporate loyalty goes for, uh, way beyond uh, how long an employee is going to stick around in an organization. Uh, it also has to do with uh, uh, how the employees or the talents are more invested in the company, how they are invested in their roles, uh, regardless of how long they've been at a particular company and how amendable they are to uh management request or how dispensable they are to management request as well so if you feel your work is very very important to you and you believe in the organization's missions and values and vision on the long long term one i mean to a great extent i can say you are, uh you embody the uh, attributes of somebody who is loyal to their environment so it goes way beyond how long you actually stick in, in an organization so then yeah the, the uh length is still very very important but uh yeah, but we, uh, the reason why we're on this call, like TRP said, is to find out whether uh, it has a future or not in light of this great resignation. <laughs> okay, Idris, your turn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that you put Aramidi and TRB have pretty much captured it, but if you explain it loosely, right, you know, the whole thinking around um, corporate layouts is what, what informs an employee choosing to stick with an organization, right? Um, regardless of, or without thinking of opportunities yeah. in other spaces, even, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, so what makes an employee stick with an organization without looking for an employment opportunity in that place? Um, regardless of the availability or unavailability of these opportunities, right? Now, if you're thinking of it in broader context, you start to think of an employee's willingness to um, sacrifice personal time, um, possible, I mean, higher income, um, leisure, um, personal commitments, you know, just to ensure that they give their 110 for an organization. So, I mean, now you cannot think of context like time. How long do you choose to do this for? I mean, six months, one year, five years, 10 years. I mean, historically, with our parents and co, the definition has always been they're going to do this give or take 20, 30 years. So that's, I mean, I'm not trying to throw any of our parents under the bus, but, you know, the, the missed holidays, the missed um, parent-teacher association meetings, and they cannot show up because, hey, they're doing, they, I mean, they just have to be loyal to the organization. So, yeah, that's, that's what it means, in my opinion. Hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot for that. You know, so um, we've been getting some interesting um, comments actually on in, in the comment section. So I want to read one from um, Mesoma, who says he read an article recently about how the circular environment has evolved and how we had an industrial revolution um, up to the social and digital revolution. Um, I think I also, I also saw something about that actually, I think sometime yesterday. And basically how it is, is that our grandparents basically worked for survival. You know, they, they worked mm. because they had to put food on the table. And then our parents worked to increase. So it was no longer about putting food on the table alone. It was also about increasing the standard of living for themselves and for their, for their children. And so now coming into our era, the way we look at work is very different. So we work more efficiently. It's more about keeping our mind, body, and soul together and operating at the, at the same level. So 
so now when we talk about corporate loyalty in the past it was more about being loyal to a company that could pay you <laughs> when they would pay you <laughs> because you had bills to be paid i mean we're not saying that that's not that's definitely still very important um but then now we see that there's so much there's so many other factors as well that affect you know loyalty to a company and which is quite interesting because in the reports that we just um in the report that we just launched called the employee satisfaction report and i will just share one slide was this uh let's see let's see if i can work this magic um whilst you're trying to sort that out sheila something that just crossed my mm -hmm. mind our parents worked for standard of living rights which you mentioned i yeah. think for us now the the, con the conversation more will be quality of you know life and quality of living beyond just exactly. standard now exactly. all the parameters you mentioned now is important for us mental health is something we think about more than our parents used to think about mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know flexibility is something we think about more than they used to think about um work life is great even balance out, you know i mean remote work we are doing literally almost everything from home so how how do we get that balance and that integration yes so i think sure yes. Yes. So, so that's the thing. So I just wanted to, so, um, on our, on the report, right. There's one of the, the chapters of our reports where it talks about what makes a good company. And then, so just to give a brief of background for this report, the survey was done with over 2000, 2700 or so, um, um, respondents, and they had to answer specific questions. And one of the, the, the questions was what makes a good company? And the different things that we see in terms of the external traits, we have strong, relatable company values and goals, um, open and effective management, flexible hours, healthcare, cover and well-being programs, and then also transparent performance management. So those were the top five external traits. Um, those are the top five external traits that were okay perfect now it's showing <laughs> i was wondering when it would appear those are the top five external traits um that matter the most to the respondents right and please if you're watching this leave it in the leave your comments in the comment section if you actually agree with this right the top five external traits now what is quite interesting from that is that for respondents who were within the age groups of say 18 to 35 um they rank strong relatable company value goals open and effective management and flexible hours as their top three while people who are over 45 ranked um i think the only thing that was different is open and effective management and health care cover and well-being programs basically benefits benefits was also like you know that were more that were um, more important to the people who are over 45 while sorry yes over 45 while from 18 to 35 they were more about the values and also the effective management and flexible hours why do you think that is so why do you think flexible hours now is such a big thing because before we never really used to talk about flexible hours flexible hours was just something that we used to um you know like yeah if you got it it felt like you know gold but now flexible hours has become something that is very important in the workplace i don't know idris do you want to because i see you smiling do you want to take a stab at that uh, why do you think it's so important <laughs> now <laughs> so i think that you know um one one major dynamic that we can't um erase right now is the fact that the world of work has changed and mm -hmm. it's most likely will never go back to what it is right um and i think following what you just shared and the slide you just presented for older people someone who is i mean or you're, you're in that age bracket where you know your kids are maybe in high school so for you your, your thinking or your expectation of is different from someone who is 18 who's just getting into the workforce i'm 18 i'm 20 i'm 21 22. i have a lot of interest i'm thinking of pursuing i have a lot of passions i'm looking to explore but at that particular point i mean 45 um, and older you're thinking okay you know what you've done decently say maybe about 20 years give or take if you start at 20 25 you've done almost 20 years of work so you know you're thinking okay now it's time for you to you know have more um more personal time to enjoy quote unquote your 
I don't want to call it the reward of your hard work, but something in that same space, right? But for younger people, you're thinking all of these things. Now, flexibility as regards to your know, work, if, if there's anything that the pandemic has showed us, is the fact that a lot of um, our ideas or our assumption of how work is done has changed. Right? Now you can work from home. Now you can send in reports anywhere. Now you can take on remote jobs. I mean, I'm a bill in Lagos and I'm working for a company in New York. Time has changed. If you're an organization or you're an employer who is not mirroring that in your reality, then, I mean, you're just literally telling younger people that um, I'm not valuing your insights at any point in time. So you might as well just um, skip. Okay. Aramide, uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Is my audio uh, clear? Yes, 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 we can hear okay, you. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that insight, Adri. Also, in terms of flexible working hours, I think, uh, like you said, uh, the future of work has changed, basically. Uh, in the past, or let's say a couple like 10 years ago, it used to be more about compensation uh, in terms of what gets, what goes to my pocket, what I take home to my family at the end of the day. But now it's more about, okay, you know what, what are... Uh, what is the impact for me long term in terms of development, personal development, in terms of uh, bringing this. some organizations that even try to, in, like Idris has said, work life integration. They try to make it so easy that you can even bring in your family into work functions. You understand, like team bondings and events and everything. And these are little, little perks that go a long way. And this is for the older generation. And for the younger generation, I think uh, because of the future of work, a lot of things have come up. So which has led to the uh, flexible working hours. Like we now are working asynchronously and working synchronously. Working synchronously is you being the global company, but you probably just want to have a particular fixed schedule. So whether you're in Nigeria, whether you're in Kenya, whether you're in South Africa, there's a particular fixed schedule you work with. But when you work asynchronously, you work within your own time. You work within your own time zone. Like you are in Nigeria, you work within eight to five West African time. You are probably in, in San Francisco or something, you work within specific time. Like that is, so there is no way you can achieve that. You can work asynchronously on a global scale without creating flexible work hours. So these are things you need to put in place if you want to ensure loyalty on the long run. So also uh, for we, the younger generations, I think another thing that also, why we crave flexible working hours is because now a lot of people don't just focus on doing one thing. I mean, back then we have a lot of people that it's just their job. Now you'll see somebody who is into content, who is into digital marketing, who offline, aside their work, they probably have a, yeah, another gig, maybe like a videography or a photography gig or something. Like, so it's so great that, like, in the past, while I was still in the recruitment consulting space, I've worked with some clients that they actually encourage the spirit in their staff. They, like, they, they ask them, when they conduct stay interviews, they ask them, so what other projects are you working on apart from what we're giving you to work on? And they pick an interest in this. So people are now working on various things outside the organization. And if you don't create flexible working hours, there's no way they're going to be able to achieve this. At some point, there's a talent to just be like, okay, you know what, I'm done. I'm just going to go focus on myself. So that's the first one. Yeah, very important. <laughs> okay, that's, that's interesting. We lost you for a few seconds there, TRB. Um, but did you get the oh, question wow. before, before that? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we, I did. Okay, we can, uh, we can I, hear you. Yeah. Okay, so great. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I got the question and I like both responses um, that came true. Um, of course, I mean, if we look at if we look at the older generation, why do we think health is more important than performance? Theory, um, which I think, I think, think is very important for them to be able to deliver the rest of work they are doing. Um, also, if we look at the performance side of things, it's also important to them to be to be clear, right? Um, role clarity is something that is probably very important to them at that age. You know, um, let's look at the younger generation. Interesting insights, right? Company values and goals, and you know. Um, flexibility and all of that. You know, as good as this seems, um, of course, even before COVID, right, um, digital transformation, technology, a lot of organizations, you know, that have become more global, they've opened the door for flexible working, you know, where you can work for a company in the US and you're in Africa, you're in Europe, you know, that's really what opened up globalization of companies is what really opened 
you know, flexible work. Now, if we're dimensioning it, because I heard Arami, they talk about the young people um, and all that. Um, let me just take us to another dimension of this, which is, I don't have the answers here, right? It's something to think of. And it's from my observation, you know, as an HR professional, being in the consulting space and all that, um, how efficient are these people, you know, um you want to do this you want to do that you want to have a back you know i know a lot of young people that are doing about five things but they complain of being broke at the end of the day so it's really about i'm sure you would agree with me let's let's throw it open right it's i'm also asking the question of you know the flexible work nature you know you are not committed 100 percent committed to your typical nine to five because you feel that flexibility will make you do a lot of other things but then your attention is divided into five areas how effective are you going to be how efficient are you going to deliver and when most people are being given feedback because they are not delivering on their primary assignments they want to leave the job you know they start complaining about their bosses they start complaining about stress right so that's another angle that i just want us to look at it from you know it may be a call for a debate we may not have all the time but i think it's a very interesting angle yeah 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 i'll hear you i agree with you man. And i think it's a very, very it definitely is angle. it definitely is a yeah. very interesting angle but yeah. but yeah. honestly if we're going to go into that debate that's 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 going to take the whole day right. it really is yeah. it really is um so yeah. anyway maybe, if i know maybe for we should have that have, we should have that as as like um, a follow-up like as, a part yeah as a follow-up yeah. yeah to this so <laughs> see how um, we'll yeah. come back and have that conversation <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so to everyone that's just joining us, welcome. Um, this is a conversation on Is Corporate Loyalty Dead? Um, hosted by Job Man Nigeria. And we're just having conversations around corporate loyalty as well as employee satisfaction and talent retention. Um, for you to be able to get more details about this, uh, the reports that we just launched at Job Man Nigeria, please go to our, our research page. So it's www.jobberman.com forward slash research and you can get a copy of our um, reports, the employee satisfaction report for 2021, which has like further insights, which we are also discussing at this at this um at this event. Now, just to give a like give also some context and some definitions, right? So I, I'm going to keep talking about external traits and intrinsic traits, right? So for anyone who's not quite clear. Our external traits are basically traits that employees yearn for in an ideal employer. So relatable company goals, flexible hours, you know, transparent um, management, stuff like that. While intrinsic traits are really the in innate traits employers ought to have. So, so it says competitive pay package. Um, yeah, there's this whole thing about <laughs> they say pay package is competitive. What is it competing against? But yeah, welfare and benefits, job security, career growth, you know, things like that. When you when you download the report, you'll be able to see more about what these external traits and the intrinsic traits are. Now, we've been getting a lot of um, comments and a lot, like seriously, and everybody's so interested in this topic. But there's one question that's actually for Idris, and it says by Miriam, it says, are there peculiarities in terms of Nigeria versus the global workforce? So that's it that Idris, but I think it's open to everyone as well. What are there peculiarities in terms of remote working in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that um, what informs the huge, well, not what um, the biggest peculiarity in terms of um, remote work in Nigeria slash Lagos and global workforce is the quality of infrastructure that we have, right? For you to be efficient and to be able to do your work, regardless of wherever it is you are, you need some basic things. Um, I mean, two, um, two key ones, electricity and internet, as is, as of now, right? And if you have, you know, you're in a space where electricity is, for lack of a better word, haphazard, and your internet providers, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but <laughs> your internet provider, your network provider is also a problem. Then it becomes, I mean, a question. I mean, that's the big, those two, I, I think, you know, um, would inform how well um, remote work I work. I mean, Nigeria, Lagos, as to any place in the world, then you cannot throw in other variables, other dynamics into it, you know. 
balance for you know family time as well as you know your work and how people understand the respect for your space when it comes to you know, working from home um and all of that so yeah, that's that's it. those two contexts then you know um individual respect for what it is to work from home not that i'm calling you and you're supposed to be working remotely but that's when you're pricing fish in lava markets because <laughs> hey it's close to your house <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just saying i'm just saying, just saying right <laughs> and uh, rami j do you, do you want to take a stab at that as well yeah uh yeah you guys the question uh miriam i have a very fantastic question by the way but i think in terms of remote work uh it's based on the organization as well the kind of tools they put in place uh also so we it's also based on the individual themselves as well. I mean the talent here, yeah, the kind of environment you live in, uh the power supply. Sometimes it might not even be power or internet, it might be noise. So imagine you stay in a crowded area and you can't take meetings sometimes, or probably you have kids. I mean, I love kids, I'm not against kids, so nobody should read me wrong. <laughs> but like <laughs> probably so we have some people that are currently working remotely, but night but Monday to Friday, nine to five, they always work at the co-working space just because of distractions and everything. So in terms of peculiarities, Miriam, I think it's just based on the organizations and it's actually based on the talent as well. And you know, based on work life balance as well, uh we hear a lot of people complain that since remote work they've been working. 9 to 12 a.m. or 9 to 1 a.m. as well. That's why I said uh, some organizations have come up with working structures either synchronously or asynchronously. And I think it's going to become a thing in Africa very soon. African startups are gradually beginning to adopt that where all tasks are not are important, but they are not urgent. So because you need to, everybody needs to start working with their time zones. You cannot, I can, San Francisco is like GMT minus seven basically and you expect me to work with that time zone i mean come on it's not it's not that realistic monday to friday i'm literally going to get one out and get to it so it's just uh, so i think it's all based on the organization and based on the individual itself and so flexibility you have to work on uh on a strong on a time structure that will favor both the talent and yourself as the employer and as the individual itself please uh stable working environment friendly working environment i think that's just it so that's the same factors pretty much apply on the global scale. Let's think about it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. I see TRB already typed out his answer. <laughs> I was just talking yeah. about. Um, yes. Yeah, so if you can please just, yeah. you know. Yeah, just, I, I just, just, I mean, very spot on the responses um, Aramide and uh, Idris have given. I just thought about the culture side of things. You know, we still have a lot of organizations that are struggling to embrace, you know, having people work from home. Um, we have a lot of organizations that are not willing to invest in resources to enable people work from home, give people laptops, let them, you know, support them with internet, maybe stipends to work from home. A lot of companies are not, you know, willing to do that yet. Uh, we have a lot of companies who strongly feel if, I, if I'm not seeing these people in the office, I don't trust that they're delivering, right? That's one side of it. And the flip side of it is a lot of employees have not even built, you know, put themselves in a position where their employers can trust them. You know, I, I meet people a lot and they're like, are you not working from home? You're always on your laptop. I said, that is what working from home is about, right? You know, we still have people who are meant to be working from home. If you call them, you're probably just hearing, oh, show this, you know, they are really, they're probably in the market. Some are sleeping. When you ask to put on their video, you can tell from their eyes that they just woke up and also a lot of that i'm sorry i'm just i'm just like this so a lot of that has really affected you know the peculiarity of lagos so i think culture infrastructure i think those those are major issues yeah i'm uh, sorry if i may add one more thing before we proceed uh Sheila, can i proceed yeah uh, also the reason why yeah, lagos please. versus the global scale will be very different is because uh a lot of companies uh I operate on a global level. Some of them have been exposed to remote work way before, way ahead of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it's already part of them. Those that were not even working remotely, that are probably in the international space or that are probably global players, they already understand what remote working is all about. But a lot of Nigerian startups, Lagos startups, according to what Miriam asked, they, some of them were forced to go remote because of COVID. Some, yes. I'm pretty sure some employers that have literally beaten themselves up the most, just because their staff are currently working remotely. Like TRB has said, some employers feel that they have to see you every day. They have to call you, hey, 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 how are you doing today? What, what hours are you doing? Like, you understand? <laughs> We're having to yeah. deliver on this. So that's why, if you notice, a lot of companies call on necessary meetings sometimes. Meetings that could have just been an email. 
Like so, that, 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 that is why I think Lagos versus the global market might still you you might still see some lack in the in the Lagos market compared to the global market in terms of remote workforce. Because to be honest, in, in some Nigerian startups were not ready for remote at all. They were yeah. forced to go remote. So that's why I think that was what led to Maryam. Okay. Yeah, and I actually and I actually yeah. do agree with you. I agree with everyone, you know, yeah. like a lot of companies in Nigeria were forced to go remote. Like COVID basically showed us Nigerians that there's another way to work besides showing up in the office every day, right? Including weekends. Um, but like TRB said, I feel like we're still we're still adjusting from employer's angle and also from the employee angle. Because a lot of employees, let's be very honest, we saw this like, you know, working from home as opportunities to have like three or four jobs. <laughs> and you know it's like oh yeah i'm working remote now and then instead of giving your 100 percent for all four you're giving less than 50 percent or 20 percent to each because you're you're unable to actually manage your time accordingly for like your for the different jobs right so there's that thing about trust that employers are still trying to build but at the same time we have this thing of where there has to be some sort of flexibility and so now we're now at the place where people are having hybrid work hours right so it's like okay let's keep both of us happy right um so you can't come to the office every day that is fine so maybe come twice a week um and then you the remainder of the the remainder of the week said dg dg in the comment section said thank god for covid <laughs> and then the re- that's something to be thankful for <laughs> and the no, remainder but, of the mm. week the remainder of the week you know you can work from home you know so there's there's this thing of when we can get to that level of trust between employers and employees in nigeria yes in the global context i'm sure everywhere else you know um internationally they've gotten to a, a better place where they understand how it works because this is not something that is new. And I think it also has to do with industry. So like in the tech industry, for instance, remote working is not new in the tech industry. However, for a lot of in other industries, this is absolutely new. And then there are some industries that, that they couldn't even afford to go remote. So say, for instance, you had a manufacturing company, you can't, you can't remotely manufacture. So, so you know, so there's a things like that, right? What well, it brings me to the next question? There was, there's a question I saw earlier, um, talking about. Let me see if I can find it about entrepreneurship. But before we go on that, go to that question. A few days ago, we had a poll on LinkedIn, and the question is: Do you see yourself working in your current company in the next six months? Interestingly, forty-six percent said no, thirty-four percent said yes, and twenty percent said maybe. Now, in our reports, we have this thing of what that is called the happiness and flight risk. And flight risk basically means that, you know, um, people who are um, looking to flee <laughs> from their career, that's the easiest way to explain it, <laughs> looking to flee um, from, their, from their current companies. And also from the report, again, you need to download the reports to be able to get like all the details. Because if I say all the details here, you won't download the report. So... You need to download the reports. My colleagues are going to be leaving the, the link to the report for you to download it. But the insights from the report shows that, you know, at the moment, there is a high percentage of people um, who are at flight risk, specifically women for some reason. Women have a higher rate of flight risk of leaving um, the companies that they are currently working with um, for, different, um, for different reasons than men do. Um, but then bringing it back to this question that Joy asked, say, what do you say about this fast spreading message of freelancing and en- entrepreneurship spirit that is spread among amidst today's youth? So painting nine to five as a nine to five job as evil and as slavery. So um, I don't know who wants to take a stab at that. I have my opinion on that. But before I even share my opinion, as it relates to the what TRB, please take it away. I mean, it, it's very interesting. I was on this particular conversation with Femi Balogun. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm sure a few of us know him. Um, I think a couple of days ago and, you know, um, I, I'm this person that I like to dimension things from different angles. I like the idea of entrepreneurship. It's a pathway, right, to employability, no doubt, right? Um, Freelance and all that, you know, it's very good to have. But my fear for a lot of young people today that just, you know, want to jump into entrepreneurship is 
do not think entrepreneurship is an escape route from what you what you think you're experiencing in the nine to five. So nine to five is not evil, right? Not everybody is cut out for nine to five, but not everybody is also cut out for entrepreneurship. So it's only more of an advice that I give to them, right? And the advice is resilience. If you're not resilient in nine to five, right? You might struggle in entrepreneurship. It's always easy at the start. But, you know, in entrepreneurship, you are your own HR, you are your own accountant, you are your own marketer until you are able to stabilize. And the big biggest advice I also have for them is, are you ready to put in the rigor of building systems and structures, right? I have a lot of people, you know, my age bracket, when we finished uni, they wanted to become entrepreneurs and they jumped straight into it without corporate experience, nothing. It was all good. But they've gotten to a stage now where those systems and structures that they refused to build them because they were focused on the money and running away from the nine to five, um, the mindset of I'm an entrepreneur, I can wake up anytime, I can decide my time. But now, because there, there's some, there's a, it's, there's a mindset of your customers. How many people have designers or tailors above 40 these days? How many people, how many people are working with photographers above 40? right how many people everybody just has a mindset of the younger you are the more innovative you are so whatever you start now think of the sustainability in the long run by the time you are 40 are you still going to have customers coming to you or there'll be younger people who are more stylish who are more you know so that's the only thing i have to say um none of them is evil but just be resilient enough to you know do what is required to sustain whatever you choose Thanks, TRV. Um, I mean, speaking of dimensions, right? Another angle to it, right? just following up on what um, TRV had said, skills are supposed to be transferable as long as you understand that they're transferable skills, regardless of what it is you do. Entrepreneurship, freelance, you know, nine to five. Now, if you think, like TRV had mentioned, oh, because I'm my boss or I'm my CEO, I can speak to people rudely or i should not understand the basic etiquette of communication i should not be accountable i should not be proactive i shouldn't manage my time well then you're just you're setting yourself up for failure that's one angle to it another angle to it is the funny fact that not everybody would actually do a nine to five as long as you understand what your interests are and you learn these skills so there was a report that came out sometime last year saying we had about 4.5 million people join the workforce and 500,000 jobs were created. If we use that alone as basic benchmark, it means some people unfortunately might not have a 95 gig to go to. Now, how do you now prepare yourself for what it is they're going to do? Now, some people choose it. So you know what? I have this interest. I intend to pursue this interest as a as a way of livelihood. How are you going to be sure that you know you understand that it is actually work? It's a business. You're responsible to customers, your clients, the same way someone who works for any organization is responsible to his own clients, right? And that's why I also think that. Just a side note, a lot of people who are, in some cases, entrepreneurs, sometimes struggle with writing something as basic as their resume because they don't understand that the skills you're supposed to put into doing your nine to five is the same skills you're going to put in your business. Um, so I don't think that, you know, nine to five is evil or is slavery. It's just you understanding what your interests are, pursuing that completely, um, respecting the skills and the spaces that you're working in. Um, and yeah, build system and structures to ensure that both, whichever it is that you're doing um, works. If you're doing a nine to five, create a system to ensure that you're delivering your optimal value at every point in time. If you run a, a business, you're an entrepreneur, you're freelancing, create a system also that ensures that you deliver value to your clients. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Aramide? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy and Idris. Uh, the insight is fantastic. Uh, Joy, very, great question. First of all, uh, I personally believe that the idea of nine to five being tagged as evil or as slavery is a motivational speaker's effect or social media effect. Like, I mean, they go out there putting in the minds of everybody mm. to be their own uh, boss, to be their own boss. They can do something, they can start off something on their own, but you don't educate them about the internal and external factors about running a business. 
about owning a business. I've been privileged like about two to three years of my life. I've been exposed to working with uh, top leadership people. So I've also have access to their calendar sometimes. Have you seen a typical entrepreneur's calendar? Like, believe me, it's not something, I'm not trying to like say they don't have work-life balance, but they might have a way to balance it, but it's not something I wish for myself. I'm not gonna lie about that. <laughs> like, you see these people's calendars and you ask themselves, do they even sleep? And you actually even sleep. So you go out there, you keep painting the idea of nine to five being sl a slavery or being like it's evil or something. And you're not even concerned that, okay, you finally push these people to become entrepreneurs. Uh, is there an enabling environment for them to create a sustainable business? Like, uh, what if they, what if, okay, they keep profit in the first year? Because there's a report that uh, I think 60% or 70% of startups fail after the second year. So what if first year they hit profit, second year they hit profit, then third year they, they can't sustain it, maybe due to some factors. Did you, do we have enough uh, microfinancing system for them? Venture capitalists obviously will not invest in a one-man business. I mean, come on. <laughs> so you are not considering this thing and you keep pushing the idea of 95 as slavery or something. But meanwhile, rather than you pushing the idea of 95 as slavery, why can't you just push the idea of employee engagement or things that will keep your talent more engaged so that they can be more productive in what they do? So one thing I will always say to everybody, man, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. The earlier you recognize that fact as a young person, the better. Like, just stick to that fact. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And to also know that entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Apple CEO, go and check how much he cashed out as bonus recently. You will know entrepreneurship <laughs> is not for everybody. You will know that as a fact. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I totally, I totally agree with you guys that yes, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Um, and you know, I'm so glad, Aramidi, you brought you brought it back in terms of employee re retention. So when I think about um, entrepreneurship, I one of the things I always say, as someone who has done the working nine to five, and then doing the and doing the freelancing for a bit, and then going back to nine to five, I will tell you, like, if you do not have the skills, whether it is a nine to five or an entrepreneur, you will suffer you need to have the skills so it's not really about being your own boss it's not really about oh i i can i can control my time <laughs> um because that is that is the glamour that is sold right the glamour of be your own boss be a ceo and and all that glitz and glams and so we walk around saying oh yes i'm i am the ceo of so 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 or and it's just a one it's just Context. you yourself and you um, you know, uh, doing your own freelance gig. And, and that is fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But just understanding that it doesn't mean you should demonize people who are actually, you know, getting their jobs and growing up the career path. Some people will have to grow through career and they will become the CEO of whatever company from growing, you know, um, in their career, while you have some other people who will start businesses and they would become the bosses of their own businesses, you know, in their own little way. But what is important in all of this is having those skills and taking your job, whether it is your own business or whether it is working as in a company, as part of the company, is taking ownership of what it is that you are doing. How do you take ownership of your skills, your responsibilities? Because again, the difference is when you when you when you're working for yourself you can decide to wake up late or you can decide to do whatever you want to do but then you have clients that you have to answer to that's also contextual <laughs> it's contextual right you, you the whole you, you i have, have my time it's contextual really. there's nothing really like having your time right and if i'm going to be a bit partial i would say when you're actually working when you're actually working for a company it's easier to say i have a work life balance right say oh my i am contracted for 9 to 5 nine to and then five. find 5 even though we know in most cases we keep working after five, but say, but from nine to five, by five, I'm done for the day. When you're an entrepreneur or when you have your own business, there's nothing really like shutting down, at least for the first few years of that business until you grow. Another thing is you're going to end up being an employer of labor as well. What message are you sending across to people who are working for you? Because you're coming from, oh, everybody should be their own boss. And now as an employer, People who are working for you, what do you expect to, to say? What do you expect them to, to, um, to, to um, abide by, right? So I would say the first thing is to see how do we or how do companies promote that entrepreneurial spirit in their employees? Because I think that is actually the main question here. How do we get employees 
to be more, um, to take better ownership of their tasks, of their jobs, um, as opposed to saying, oh, I want to go out there and just, you know, um, be my own boss, that kind of thing. Because I feel like you can be your own boss with your job because you're doing very well and your skills are, are being um are being um, harnessed and grown over time while you're doing while you're doing your your job so thank you very much for that question joy that was a very that that was a very um, insightful question um so um so i was just going to to the next or maybe before i go to before i go to my next question let me see what other question we've had and thank you so much for the comments. I'm really, really loving the engagements today. Like, um, okay, so there's a question here from Ido. He says, please, what lessons can we draw about reciprocal loyalty between companies and their workers? Ido, could you please explain a little bit more what you mean by that? Reciprocal loyalty. Reciprocal loyalty between companies and their workers are you saying companies being loyal to their workers or um I would workers assume being, so. okay yeah I, I, i'm expecting him to just give a little bit a uh, little bit more insight into that question then moving on let me go to the next question um, um TRV, i was about to talk about that part too, so thanks for making reference to that <laughs> 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 okay. um, so, 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 says, I think one of the issues that should be addressed is how do these organizations employ, engage employees while being remote? If they aren't engaged productively, how do they best, how they, how do they get the best from them, or even foster any sort of loyalty? Okay, that's going back to our, um, going back to the conversation on remote working um in this particular in this particular era post covid if there's anything like post post covid so let me just go back to one of our questions so from your experience and i think i'll start with TR, trb for this one for, from your experience what do you think what steps can companies take in improving employee engagement and retention all right thank you um it's, it's a very difficult one in this day and age, to be honest, um, because, I mean, the workplace is, is, now, is now filled with generational dynamics, right? And I'll use an example of a recent experience, right, um, which, you know, we are working on. There is the dynamics of the older people, you know, the baby boomers, millennials, Gen Z, and all of that. So one... I would say the organization needs to first understand what is important to the people and by the people in the different categories in which they are. So you can have a blended solution to, to driving, you know, engagement. So what's important to the older people, what's important to the, you know, mid-age people, what's important to the Gen Zs. Um, it's first of all, you need to create that understanding because if you're coming up with, you know, engagement initiatives, um, some people will feel sidelined, you know, in as much as we think younger people are leaving the organizations today, we actually have a lot of older people who are also leaving organizations. Why? Because they feel like they can't work with younger people. They feel like these people are frustrating, but the truth is they may be frustrating and getting the work done. And that is frustrating some of the older people out of the workplace. So it's important to, you know, have a very robust plan, um, health, health something one thing we do in my own organization is uh, we try as much as possible to take out micromanagement we try as much as possible to take out micromanagement and how do we ensure without micromanagement people are still doing their things set clear goals set clear goals have clear deliverable timelines and all that uh, we also have you know monthly monthly get together you know where people just come on even though it's virtual Right, we call it the connect sessions. You know, where you know we connect, we have fun, we chill, um, and we rotate. Maybe a young person is doing this time, a male is doing it the next time. You know, we try to make sure everybody has a sense of belonging in the organization. Um, also, there's one of the values that we have, which is co-creation. Right, the value of co-creation is something very powerful in driving employee engagement, because. Co-creation helps everybody to bring their hearts to the table. You know, no idea is stupid. 
no suggestion is lost. Um, come up with your own ideas and perspectives. And one of the things we've noticed is, personally, I call the Gen Zs the icing on top of the cake, right? Um, they may not be ready to do the whole brainstorming and all of that with you, but they have initiative, they have innovations in putting things out. So that 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 thing excites them when you give them that um, leverage, you know, to to come up with an, it's an idea that, you know, how can we push this out? You know, they feel so engaged, they feel empowered, you know, and that was my last point, um, create a culture of empowerment. And I think those little tips would help. Mm. Thanks a lot, Yarbi. Aramide, because I know you started off his introduction yeah. on talent retention. So <laughs> yeah, what, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, there is no way you can retain talent without data. You need to actively understand the data of your organization and relate it to the cal caliber of people you hire. And it needs to affect every step of your people processes from recruitment to onboarding to uh, employee engagement. So in doing this, you first need to understand it the three main types of uh, employees in every organization. We have the engaged ones, the not engaged, and those that are actively disengaged. According to Forbes' recent research, about 15% of the workforce are engaged. This 15% of the workforce that are engaged, they are basically employees that are loyal, they are emotionally committed to the organization, and they invest in their work and they take on responsibilities, even outside the job description. These are people that go above and beyond for your organization. And the not engaged ones, they make up 67% of the workforce. They, they can be difficult to identify because they appear happy and satisfied in their position, but they, they do the bare minimum. That's why you see that organization, everybody's happy, everything is going well. Then suddenly, you just see that the organization is not meeting its goals or its targets or achieving its long, either short term goals or the long run. So that is the other percentage. Then we have the actively disengaged one. These people, they make up 18% of the general workforce. And these are the people that they consistently create a negative and a toxic environment and they're very, very domineering. It's funny how these guys are actually like the subject matter experts or the consultants or the people, I, I don't mean consultant literally, you know what I mean in that case. Like they are the, sometimes they appear to be the big shots in an organization. So because of that, they have significant influence over others. So when you understand these three types of, uh, of talent within your organization and you carry out, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, research to probably understand the, uh, the caliber they fall in and you identify them then you can now proceed to now focus on talent retention. So the first step in talent retention, you need to get your hiring right. Like put everyone in the right roles. Sometimes you like a candidate and because of uh, interviewer bias, the candidate might not be a great fit for that position. And yet it's a look for a way to squeeze the candidate into the organization. What do you think is going to happen in the long run? Is that other candidate leaves or is that other talent leaves the organization or is it going to make someone leave the organization? One way or the other, it's going to affect the same goal. So get your hiring right. In terms of getting your hiring right, that's a separate topic entirely. Like it's a long process entirely. Like we'll get there as well. So you also need some data-driven measures as well. Also, uh, what people need to understand is not all team leads or not all managers are people managers. You need to understand that before you promote people to the team leads or before you make them managers. Does this person have people leadership goals? Does this person have what it takes to not necessarily mentor but to groom people? but or to take people from where they are to where you want them to be. Like you literally see some JDs and you'll see in three months, we want you to be like this. In four months, we want you to be like this. In a year, we expect you to be doing this. In two years, we expect you to be in this particular position. How do you think they come up to those particular results? They, 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 it's based on research. It's based on the fact that they invest in people that they promote to the managers. Like you put, like give them proper leadership training. Make them accountable. They have to, your team leads have to be your culture custodians. Most of the big organizations we're looking up to today in terms of culture and every other thing, follow their team leads or their managers on social media. You will notice one thing consistently about them. They are aggressive culture champions. They push their culture in everybody's face, which is fantastic and lovely to have. So not all team leads are people managers. You need to get that right before you promote them to become managers or team leads. And thirdly, what I also recommend is, uh, what's it called? Checking often. Everybody comes up with fantastic initiatives all the time. Oh, yeah, we're going to do this today. Oh, yes, we're going to do team bonding today. Oh, yes, we're going to set up gyms. Oh, yes, we're going to put an arcade game in the office. Oh, do you measure it? You need to start measuring these things. And there are tools for you to measure all these things. Like, there are various tools out there. I can drop some uh, for you later. And, like, you need to start measuring these things. Carry out research. Send, use uh, 
uh, or survey management systems to send out surveys basically so that you can extract the data from the back end. So you need to measure all the, all the uh, initiatives you're putting in place for employee retention and satisfaction. So basically, get these three things right, understand the types of employees you have in your organization, and believe me, retaining your talent would not be a problem at all. Wow, thanks a lot for that, TRB and Arami did. Um, so we have five minutes towards the end of this, right? Um, but before we go, there's so um, there was something that Arami said. He said he has said it a few times. He said, "Get your hiring right," and which brings me to a, another um, another another um, point or one of the, the the takeaways from the satisfaction report where we talk about career growth and how career growth is very important. Now, one of the insights we got from a report is that um, financial stability um, is important. No, let me just backtrack. So from the reports, there was also something about location, right? Location demographics and how the location of a company also affects what employees are looking for. So apparently, employees that are located in Lagos are looking for career growth while employees who are located in Port Harcourt are looking for financial stability, which I find very interesting because I would think financial stability is more Lagos than Port Harcourt. Um, but why do you think that most young people in Lagos are more about career growth than anything else? Idris, what do you think? Um, so I, I think that using geographical locations, right, as just the context, the reason why, I mean, one possible reason why, you know, more people in Lagos might be thinking career growth is the amount of roles that you have within the space here and the amount of talent that is equally jostling for that same role or the amount of roles we have. So if we are, I mean, five young people in Lagos and we're all doing the same jobs, in two years, I mean, long-term planning now, professionally, three years is extremely long. So the most anybody's thinking of is one to three, one to three, one to two years, one year, one year, six months is long-term career plan for anybody. And it's just because of the way, you know, the environment is also shaped here. More people are thinking, what's the next step for me? What's the next step for me? Now, the question why, you know, Lagos might seem more than Port Harcourt is beyond, I mean, Lagos to a large extent is the economic capital of Nigeria to a large extent, right? So you find out that using that as a benchmark alone, more people are here, more opportunities, or in some cases, less opportunities are here. So how do you distinguish yourself from the next person? You're not looking to stay in the same job for three years, right? And that's one thing that, you know, employers are failing to grasp. Start to have conversations with people. I mean, career development, career pathways is something that, you know, more people are actually struggling with right now so are you having this periodic conversations with them to say hey, you know what you can't grow now again enough, enough dynamic to it is most times in some organizations growth is already stifled there's a certain level which you can't grow beyond and that's the i mean as a function of the way the organization is shaped so if you know you grow upward can you grow sideways okay you know what skills do you have what interests do you have or oh, you cannot become the team leader of x team but you have x interest in social and social skill do you want to learn that so if you're not providing that, you're literally just pushing people um, out. And that's what it is. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it for me. Yeah, TRB already has his comment here. It's like career growth is important in Lagos because Lagos is hard. Lagos. I agree. Lagos is hard. <laughs> Very hard. <dude>. Lagos is <laughs> hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I also I found that that was actually one of the insights I found very interesting because when I started thinking back at a, a few of my friends who live outside Lagos, you find that a lot of them would stay in a company five, 10 years, and they don't see it as a big deal. But then you meet someone in Lagos and they tell, they tell you, oh, I've been in a company for three, four years. You're like, oh, wow, that long? <laughs> and you're, you're already sure, asking questions. Years. So it was so it was insights like that from the report that made me realize, oh, actually, people in Lagos are more around career growth than, than yes. financial. Yes, just like Joyce said, career growth actually leads to possibility of financial um, stability and projection. But you know, it's it's that it's things like that that you realize. Look, well, actually, that's true. Most of us in Lagos are more like, like in, you know, after two years, where am I headed? Am I, you know, am I a team lead? Am I not? Things like yes, TRB. I want to give an example, if you don't mind, but. I, I hope this example will not mislead some people to make wrong decisions, but it's a personal journey for me, right? 
Um, I, I used to work in the bank, in a particular bank at some point. Um, I think I've always been that restless person. So if you're talking about career growth and jumping, moving organization, maybe I'm a Gen Z, I don't even know, but I'm just, I've just been moving. You're you know? a Gen Z in your spirit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this this story I'm about to tell about the career growth is is just I learned sometimes ago that my career is like chess, right? And the moves you make at times determine how successful you'll be. And you know, I I saw I was working in this particular bank and I looked at the um I think it was was it Aramide or Idris that talked about the career ladder, you know? I looked at it that for me to get to a CEO of this bank let's even take ceo out of it a gm of this bank is going to take me the next 21 years right to get to that level if i continue my career in this bank because people are staying four years on a grade three years on a grade not because you're not even meeting targets but just because they keep bringing some targets that you can never even meet right so what i did was i moved i moved i moved i moved and I'm telling you, I left that bank in 2017, right? And where I am today, if I'm to go back to that bank, those that we joined together, the moves I've made has put me five steps ahead of them. That will probably take most of them about 10 to 15 years if they still remain in that bank. So I think the, the drive is one, there's competition out there. There's demand for talent out there. And it also depends on your personal aspiration. Where do you see yourself and how do you want to get there? So I think aside the fact that, like I said, it may be a joke, but if you speak to a lot of people, why they are so quick to want to move jobs is because expense keeps rising. You know, quality of life, they are looking for better quality of life. So the moment someone gets a job, they are paying you 250K. Um, another one is 300, you move. <coughs> sorry so yeah i, I just thought to chip that in that so it's a personal yeah. thing now yeah. drive also determines great yeah. okay yes uh, Ramide, you're gonna add? Yeah. yeah so to back up the data uh about lagos people and portacos people why portacos are looking for more money if in terms of uh standard of living and paying uh should i say paying power or something or should i say pay structure or pay package you cannot compare the companies in lagos the companies in portacos like the company, if you if you uh, you've been in the talent space for a while, I think everybody on this call has been in the talent space for a while. You will know that uh, in terms of pay package, if you're in Porta Cost, it's probably just oil and gas company, and maybe just energy oil servicing company. That I, I guess that will probably be like in the leading uh, aspect of pay pay grade. Every other company there, you're probably, I think they fall below the average pay grade in Lagos. I, I can say that confidently because we've tried to recruit some roles in Lagos and tried to recruit some roles in Port Harcourt simultaneously. And you could see the gap in salary. So there's a reason why probably, probably that's underwritten. You might be in Lagos and you might be in a role for three years. Within that three years, you've gotten probably four salary increase within that three years in a particular position. But you might be in Port Harcourt and you might be in a role for two years and you might still be on the same salary. Or you might still be on the same side for probably one year plus. And so that is probably why there's a gap in, in some of the So that's why you might probably get that data. Wow. Like that. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. So, so guys, um, I know we've, we're a few minutes out, over an hour now. I just want to remind everyone that you can please download our employee satisfaction report. Um, the, the URL is jobberman.com forward slash research. And then you can download the report and get more details about this employee satisfaction. Thank you so much for your time today. Like seriously, between TRB, Idris and Aramide, I think we can stay here all day and just keep talking about our <laughs> insights. Uh, but, before, you know, uh, but before we go, um, my, my, I think my last question really, or what I would say, I wouldn't really say a question, but what would you advise employers today? What is the one tip that you will share with employers in terms of keeping their employees satisfied and retaining talent? Um, TRB, we can start with you. Yeah, I think keeping your employees satisfied and retaining talent is really about understand what's important to your employees. Um, yeah, design your employee engagement and retention strategy with a human-centered approach right um don't companies need to stop the shove it down your, your throat approach 
right? Design for the people, design your engagement strategy for the people, design your talent acquisition strategy to think beyond your immediate needs, you know, think sustainability, think think rewards, right? Rewards is very important, no matter how we, we, we talk about it. Rewards, employers may not always like to hear rewards, but rewards is very important. Um, your culture is very important. You know, you need to give people an enabling culture to be able to thrive, to feel comfortable. You know, you need to give your employees some sort of psychological safety. You know, we still have organizations where, you know, people are not able to speak up because of the fear of being bullied or retaliation and all of that, you know. Um, like, DG, listening to your employees and communicating with them. Basically, listen to your people, communicate with them. If you can't do what they want, let them know why. You know, just make it a relationship. And I think a lot of organizations will experience um, better engagement and retention. Aramide? Yeah, uh, personally, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, numbers don't lie. I, I don't like mathematics. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, but I believe numbers don't lie. So therefore, make data-driven decisions all the time. It, it's, everything's still tight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think, yeah. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Yes. Back and say, yeah. Yes. So make data-driven decisions, basically. So if you're going to listen to your employees and communicate with them, you will still need to send some sort of information, and information is basically data. So we've had some people that report to probably global heads of HR. I have some of them as friends that work on a global scale and they try to effect a particular change in the organization and the manager is asking them, what data do I have to pass this up? Because one thing is when you want to present people's strategies to management or to the leadership level, they are not looking at A said this, oh, this is why talent in this country are happy. This is why talent in Canada are happier. No, what they want to see is the numbers. Yeah, you've collected those information, you've sifted those information, put it into like but like just make data driven decisions numbers don't lie secondly invest in survey management tools like invest in those tools as well measure because those tools are what will help you to measure feedback you need to measure you cannot put all these initiatives in place and not measure and evaluate at the end of the day you need to measure that is how you know okay which initiative is working for my organization and which one do i need to yank up and which one do i need to focus more energy and attention on so invest in tools uh, make data different decisions. Another thing, diversity is very, very important. You need to build diverse things because one thing about building diverse things, and I don't mean building things in South Africa or something. In Nigeria, you can still build diverse things. It can be those with college, those without college. It can be uh, Igbos, Yorubas. It can be males and females. It can be based on age. Diversity is so broad. You can't really define diversity. A diversity, like you can't streamline it to one particular thing. The good thing about diverse things and diverse minds is different ideas come up, and you're able to look at those ideas and pick. And everybody is able to look at it and say, okay, you know what? This works best. If something works best for a diverse group of people, there's a very high chance that it will work well for even a more bigger organization you understand what i mean like so imagine an organization imagine a team with uh, with probably like people from 20 nationalities and they come up with a particular decision deploy that to a 500 um, uh, people organization it will work no way yes right so diversity is very very important consider diversity in the decisions as well and yeah every other thing would be great idris um i would say that you know if there is anything that the last um 12 to 18 months has taught anybody is the fact that you know employees are craving more investment right in the human aspect of work so for you for employer partners i mean quick advice would be um ask the right questions before you think of any initiative or you create any idea right for example busy questions i mean are we building maybe a sense of community in this organization um our benefits aligned with what our employees expect and i mean find out those answers to those questions yourself i think that employers and i mean more organizations should um develop a much and a higher level of empathy right for what empl employees are going through now this is not just you know what they are going through just personally professionally as well and pair that empathy with um the determination to act more people do not have clarity in terms of what their careers look like create a properly structured career path for each person um i'm struggling with personal needs create an employee assistance program to meet that particular need um i'm struggling with whatever it is health issues how are you ensuring that you're thinking of a system to match that so ask 
the right questions before you think of any initiative, match that um, your responses with empathy and determination to act, um, rework your EVPs to fit every individual in the organization, regardless of, you know, the age or the generational um, gap that they fall into. Um, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it for me. Oh, thank you so much. So just to recap what the three of you said, so for an understand what is important to your employees, make data-driven decisions and invest in your employees by asking the right questions. So thank you so much for your time. And just to add to that, if you're an employer, even if you're not an employer, download the job employee satisfaction report, and then you can get more data-driven insights as to what employees are looking for and what, what are the things that make them happy and keep them satisfied. So thank you so much for your time today, Arami Day, TRB, and Idris. And to everyone who joined us, and they were very active. I, I see a few people that are, um, are, are regulars in, our, in the comments section. So thank you so much as well for joining in on the conversation. And, you know, we do quite a lot of things at Jobberman. So please, in addition to downloading the report, feel free to check out our soft skills training. So jobberman.com forward slash soft skills. And then you can also check out the platform for up-to-date latest jobs that are available, um, in, available in Nigeria today. So thank you so much and do have a great day. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.